Um, yeah, so feel free to turn your webcams on if you have them, um, but definitely turn off your speakers. Thanks. <laughs> And just so you know, um, all of our sessions will be recorded. And a big part of that is so that if you can't make it to our Monday session, it's okay because we will record them and put them up on YouTube. And after each session, we'll stop recording and then we'll still be here to answer questions if you have those. But feel free to ask questions throughout the time today. We've got lots of really great NIAC staff here that can help to answer probably just about any question you have. So make it a really hard one for them to answer. <laughs> All right, so welcome to the Adaptation Planning and Practices for Forests and Ecosystem Management online training. We're so excited you're here. Um, this is the only online training that we're putting on this year. And so far, I think we have about 60 people who, are, who will be joining us over the next seven to eight weeks. Okay, so our agenda for today is um, pretty rich. Like I was saying, I, there's going to be a few lectures where we will go the full hour and today is definitely one of them. But most of our lectures will be somewhere around a half an hour to 45 minutes. In today's uh, lecture, we will cover some uh, pretty quick welcome and introductions so that you get a better understanding of who we are and we've just been these like digital beings that have been emailing you so you'll get to know us and the group that we work for uh, then we'll really launch into the training overview and if anyone has read the training syllabus then some of that information will just be old hat but for those who haven't we'll give you the cliff notes crash course then we'll jump right into the adaptation workbook, because as you know, this whole training is set to go through each of the different components of the adaptation workbook. And so we will launch right into what step one is, give you that explanation, give you an example, and then give you your assignment for the week. We'll also give you a quick tutorial of how to use the adaptationworkbook.org technology if you haven't um, already gotten into it already. It's kind of one of those cumbersome things. So we like to spend as much time on it as we can so that you, you're set up for success. Okay, well, welcome. Um, this training is hosted by, uh, Maddie and I are definitely the, the lead people coordinating, but there are going to be quite a few people that you will get to interact with over the next couple of weeks. And that will be in our lectures and also in our discussion sessions. And so their names are presented here. I think we're actually missing one person's name, Madison Brady. Sorry, Madison, he was on the fence. So now he's, <laughs> done. but he's in charge of a discussion session. Anyways, um, many of us will take over uh, leading each of the adaptation workbook steps through a series of lectures and are going to be the point people for each of your discussions discussion sessions. And so if you'd like to learn more about our group and who we are and the work that we do, um, definitely look into us at forestadaptation.org slash team. But when you think about our group, we really are just a bunch of folks here that are he here to help coach you through this process. And so we hope that you lean on us when you're having difficulties getting through this process. And, and by no means do we want you to feel isolated or alone. So please reach out to us if you have any questions. The group that we are all working for is the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, otherwise known as NIACS. The Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science is a really cool organization that uh, works uh, is a collaborative partnership of both federal and research and conservation, higher education, and even tribal organizations that have come together under this idea of pursuing you know, and developing synthesis products on climate and carbon. And our whole perspective is to help foster that communication and to be the bridge between science and management on the topics of climate change and their effects on forests and ecosystems in the Midwest and Northeast area. And so you can see that um, what we're doing here is we're bringing all of these really great perspectives and ideas as it relates to land management and conservation. And um, we're hoping that we can hold all of those ideas together so that when we're creating these products and having these uh, communication opportunities that we're doing our best to represent all of those different entities that are part of 
this whole landscape in the Midwest and Northeast. Many of us, I will say right before that, many of us are employed through the Michigan Technological University and the US Forest Service. Okay. We also, uh, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science helps to support the work that the USDA Northern Forest Climate Hub does. And if you haven't heard of the USDA Climate Hubs, they're this agency-wide mission to help bring outreach and communication to different regions of the United States on the topic of climate change in conservation and farming and woodland and forest ownership and management. Our, uh, one of our big goals is to support how the USDA agency um, can tackle this big topic of climate change in planning. So not only are we working with landowners like you and, consul and consultant foresters, um, but we're also working within the agencies to help build their agency capacity so that they are better equipped to tackle this problem as well. And you can learn more about the USDA Climate Hubs at that link below. Um, our region is that Midwest and Northeast region, and, and we uh, focus specifically on forests. Great. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ground us for this training in a uh, land acknowledgement. So um, all of us instructors and the participants in this training are coming from different places. We're representing diverse geographies across North America, um, but we're all here because we're dedicated to the stewardship of these places. Um, but we really want to start off this training by acknowledging that um, across North America are the, are the ancestral homelands and current homelands of indig indigenous peoples, and there is a deep history of stewardship as well as ongoing stewardship being done by um, tribal nations across the continent. And as people either professionally and or personally involved in land management, um, it's important that we really seek to improve our understanding of this context. Um, and yeah, so we wanted to share also this, this image here, which depicts a map from the native land tool, which is linked here. And so if you're not already familiar with this tool, it's really great. Um, we encourage you to use that um, to, to learn more about the indigenous peoples associated with your area. And so I am based in northern uh, lower Michigan. And so this is the homelands of the Anishinaabe people, the Ottawa, um, Potawatomi, and uh, Chippewa tribes. And Danielle is based in Rhode Island. So I'll let her explain. Yeah, and so using this tool has been a really nice opportunity to learn more about the tribes located in Rhode Island, which are the Narragansett Nation and the Niantic people. And I just want to take some time to honor that relationship of, you know, their, their ongoing relationship with this land as well. Um, one thing that we have on this slide that's super important is that, you know, a land manage, a land acknowledgement is only a smart, a small part of supporting Indigenous communities. And I just want to point out that we have really taken that to heart. And over the years, we have tried to, and are currently, um, have ongoing and building relationships with tribal peoples throughout the Midwest and Northeast, and have been working alongside them as they're thinking about this topic and supporting them on their um, you know, supporting them to create resources and even doing outreach alongside them on climate change and conservation of native and treaty lands. All right, so here we are today all together to think about this pretty tricky topic, climate change. Um, you know, we, we want to acknowledge <laughs> So many different things, but the I guess the big elephant in the room is that we're all here to really um, think about this tricky topic and how it applies to the, the lands that we care about. We know that climate change presents so many different challenges, not only to the forests and ecosystems that we might even already be observing uh, changing over time, but, um, you know, we're here because we're acknowledging that those changes are only going to continue and that um, in, in some 
instances may ramp up and really increase the risk for some of the places that we really truly deeply care about. And so that's sort of the framing for why we're doing what we're doing, right? We're here to learn about adaptation planning. We're here to figure out a, a clear and transparent way to help us understand and logically connect why we're going to take the actions that we're taking, you know, really to set ourselves up so that we're, you know, within that cone of uncertainty and taking uh, actions that will help us better um, set this landscape up so that it can cope with the challenges that are ahead. Um, another big part of what we're doing here is acknowledging that uh, we're all doing something different on the landscape. We're all managing different sized lands. We're all, um, you know, maybe conserving from different perspectives. There really isn't a one size fits all answer to any of these problems. And really there never has been, right? So, you know, we want to acknowledge that you're all very unique and you're all very different. And what you'll be doing in this training and creating these adaptation plans will be really different. And that's because there are no one size solution, no one size fits all solutions. And um, as we go through this process together, it's it's probably going to be apparent to some of you that in some cases that business as usual approach is just not going to be sufficient. And so we're hoping that um, you know through the training and the resource that we're providing that that will give you that spark to think just a little differently, or or maybe in a discussion session you'll learn from each other and and take a different approach. So in this training, um, some of the main, the purpose of this training and the clear objectives that we have set out are to um, help you create that adaptation plan. It's really designed to support professionals as they're considering the, the effects of climate change in their real world project planning. So the objective should be um, pretty clear and, to you. And I can tell you that we're definitely going to hit all of these objectives. Uh, today, we'll work through clearly identifying project goals and objectives that helps to set that context for the plan. And then in the following sessions, we'll dive into understanding the local effects of climate change and then coach you through developing those specific actions that can help you meet your goals and objectives on the landscape. At the end of the time together, um, we're going to be so excited to learn about your climate informed plans and we'll help, you know, we're, we're really looking forward to your presentations. And then we're also going to give you some tips on how to better communicate with your partners on this topic, because for some professionals, it is still a tricky topic to tackle. Um, the most, like one of the coolest things I think about this training is that you have access to all of us. And so we really hope that you reach out to us throughout this, this time. Okay, so what did you actually sign up for, right? Those are big hand wavy things talking about what you're going to achieve over this time together, but what are the logistics? Next slide. All right, so we do have some training exp expectations. Um, we will have a lecture session just about every week, and it will be at this time, Monday afternoon, 2 to 3 Eastern, and it'll run through that entire session. There will be one break week in April, and we have found that having that break week is super helpful because it's easy to get distracted, it's easy to get behind on this planning, and so that break week provides that opportunity just to catch up. We're also providing two optional sessions and the optional lectures provide that added time to really dive into some uh, specific resources that we found folks really want a lot of time with. And so you don't have to come to these, they will be recorded, uh, but we would love to have you there. So the first one is upcoming on March 29th and that's where we will explore the USDA Forest Service Tree Atlas tool. And so it'll be us paired with one of the developers from the Tree Atlas and we'll walk through the tool, but then leave a lot of time for questions and answers. So if you would like to come, you know, with your experiences of how you've used the Tree Atlas tool or some questions, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, the next one is all about learning about the adaptation strategies and approaches. We'll have a really nice, unique opportunity for you to talk to some of the authors and then just to dive right in and ask any type of question you might have related to adaptation strategies. So those are our lectures. And like I said, most of them will be recorded. 
We will have four sessions during the training during that eight weeks uh, where we will ask you to come to a regionally focused discussion group. And these discussion groups is really just an opportunity for you to share where you are in the process and what you're thinking about, what those considerations are, and for you to learn from others. So we would really love it if you came, but we understand if you are, um, you know, double booked for whatever reason, just give us a heads up. Now, we've broken you up into those discussion groups based on your region, but if you've seen the calendar appointments and they're just not going to work with you, for you, please just reach out. Uh, we have time on Tuesday and Wednesday in the morning and in the afternoon, and so we can just move you into one of those sections, um, whatever one works. Now, when it comes to the optional sessions, we will send out a blanket calendar appointment for both of those today, but you can always decline if you don't think that you'll be able to make it. Okay, so don't feel like you have to. <laughs> you don't have, there's no obligation. Next slide. For those of you who need continuing education credits, we are pre-approved through the Society of American Foresters and the International Society of Arboriculture. Um, for some pretty hefty continuing education units and credits. So it's, you know, this is a really great opportunity for you to score big. And all we ask is that you keep track of your own attendance. And at the end, we'll just give you a form and ask you to fill it out. So it'll be pretty painless on your part as long as you participate throughout the training. For those who are looking for additional credits that from organizations not listed here, just reach out to us and we can um, do what we can to apply so that you can get those credits as well. Next slide. Okay, so that was sort of like um, a high level overview, but what I want to point out is that I have sent you a syllabus and then followed up with a newsletter. So please read that syllabus. It has so many details about the training, schedule, weekly instructions, um, tutorials on how to add a project, the adaptation workbook and brief. Um, that's really going to be that cornerstone document. We do have one change to make, which is on page two, there's a table with dates that are incorrectly listed, but otherwise it's all pretty perfect. So follow along each week and you will be right on track. We will send newsletters after each lecture that will give you that um, YouTube link for the lecture and then also give you some really cool resources to follow up on that are also in the syllabus. So it's just another way to get your information. Let us know if you don't have those though and um, put your name in the chat and I can follow up with you. And next slide. Okay, so um, we're trying to give you this training material in a thousand different formats so that whatever one works for you will get to you. <laughs> but don't be overwhelmed. If you open up the adaptation workbook, you will find all of the training materials that I just showed you also listed here. So the logistics um, and the training syllabus. So it is there for you as well. And next slide. And lastly, in this section, um, I just want to, you know, give the, the normal, we expect that you'll be engaged, you know, so as much as you can in a virtual training, please close your email, um, try to get your homework done within that week, try to get it done on that Monday before the next lecture, because we'll go through on Monday and look at all of your projects and just to make sure that you're keeping up. And um, let us know if you're getting overwhelmed or busy or just, you know, aren't going to be able to stay on track. And that'll really help us understand your progress. And maybe we can spend some one-on-one -on -one time with you to get you where you need to get to. So as much as possible, look at the training syllabus and reach out to us if you have any questions. And with that, I'll hand it over to Maddie. Great. Thank you for that overview, Danielle. I think there is one uh, lingering question in the chat about those dates that we goofed up in the syllabus. Um, and then also, if you could share a link to the adaptation workbook, that would be awesome. So great, I'm gonna now tackle why we're all here. So we're all gonna get on the same page about um, defining climate adaptation to start. So we define uh, adaptation as the adjustment of systems in preparation or in response to climate change. And so how do we make those adjustments or help set ecosystems up for those adjustments? We do that by developing adaptation actions that are designed to intentionally address climate change impacts 
and vulnerabilities while meeting goals and objectives. And so it's important to note that um, the adaptation activities that you are going to be developing throughout this training are in most cases really going to be building upon um, you know, the existing sustainable land management and conservation um, that you're already doing in most cases. So, um, you know, it could be that much of what you're already doing makes really good sense as, uh, as a response to climate change, but just becomes that much more important. Um, however, this training is also a really good chance to deliberately um, evaluate your situation and potentially develop new management approaches um, given the climate change vulnerabilities that you might identify. And just to kind of reiterate what Danielle um, kind of set the scene for us already, there really is, you know, no single answer um, and no one size fits all approach for what climate adaptation looks like. It's going to look different for everyone here, um, depending on that who, uh, what, why, when, and where of your project. So that's why our emphasis here is really on creating a framework and a container for you to work within to develop adaptation actions based on your own expertise and familiarity with your um, project area. And so that is where the adaptation workbook, which we're going to be um, relying on throughout this training, comes in. So the adaptation workbook is a structured but flexible approach that NIAC's designed to help managers integrate climate considerations into management planning and decisions. And so really it breaks the planning process down into um, manageable chunks that allow us to work through things in a really tangible way at the project level. Um, but again, what's really essential here is that it does not make any recommendations. So the whole process really centers on um, the manager's expertise and judgment um, and is really that platform to allow you to kind of evaluate what you're already doing and take credit for that good work already being done, but also creates an opportunity for you to um, recognize new approaches to dealing with climate related threats and vulnerabilities. And then also this serves as a really good communication tool um, since basically, you know, going through the process of completing the adaptation workbook is going to help you to clarify and articulate how you've intentionally considered climate adaptation in your management plans. So it'll just really set you up nicely to be able to, um, you know, talk about that internally um, with your colleagues and also share that with partners and the general public. So here are the five steps of the adaptation workbook process um, all laid out. As you can see, it's a really um, logical step-by-step -step process that connects the dots between um, your, your management uh, goals and objectives, your climate vulnerability um, and climate impacts in step two, which um, will be using various vulnerability assessments, scientific literature and other resources to explore. And then um, we really connect those dots to our climate adaptation responses in step four, and then uh, monitoring and evaluation in step five. And so our hope is really that after using this process um, for the project that you've brought to the training, you're gonna hopefully continue to find this to be a supportive process and really return to it to develop um, plans for other properties. And one really neat thing is that a lot of people at this point um, throughout working with NIAX have used the adaptation workbook to develop adaptation plans. And we like to feature um, a lot of those projects as adaptation demonstration projects. So we have over 500 um, real world uh, project teams that have used the workbook so far. And not all of them are featured on this um, adaptation portal, but I think we have at least 300 or so featured on the website. And so these are all um, projects that were developed either through our in-person or online trainings, and they all provide real world examples of climate change adaptation. So um, you can click on each one of the um, dots to pull up a unique example of what climate change looks like on the ground in that location. So we definitely recommend taking a look at these in combination with um, the other resources that we're using throughout this training, because it's really helpful for conceptualizing um, 
what adaptation can look like in a variety of different ecosystems and circumstances. And we're really grateful when managers are willing to share their story with us. And we hope that, you know, by the end of this training, we're all going to be sharing um, our projects at the end here. And so um, the more we can publish, the more we can, you know, spotlight real world adaptation examples during other trainings and consultations um, and just really create this, this fantastic resource for people to explore a diversity um, of projects from around the country. Okay, so before we move on, I guess we'd like to just pause and see if there are any questions so far. Okay, great. If anything does come up, um, just again, feel free to drop that in the chat as we're moving along. So we are going to get started today by um, looking at step one in the adaptation process. So that first step, you know, starts with defining our location and project, of course, um, and, our, and our goals and objectives for the area. So we ask all of you to bring a real world project to focus on in the training. Um, and everyone was really great about um, submitting a step one worksheet to us uh, when they registered. So that prompted you to describe your project and define some goals and objectives. Um, so those all look really, really great. Um, but this week we're gonna be just kind of focusing on refining those and making sure that you feel um, really solid in those as a foundation um, so that we can move forward with the adaptation process. And so, um, you know, we asked you to choose a project that you are either really familiar with or currently working on, or maybe something um, that you would like to dedicate more time towards looking at, um, because we really want this process to be as relevant and applicable as possible for you. And also the more familiar you are um, with the project site you're choosing, you know, the, the better able you'll be to consider which, which climate change um, impacts are going to be the most influential. So I'm gonna provide a little more context right now on just doing a gut check and making sure we're selecting the, the right size and complexity project for the training. Um, but if you still find that after this, you want to check in with one of us, we're definitely happy to give you feedback um, just to just to check in and see if you're um, if you've chosen what we like to call the Goldilocks zone. So um, this is all about, yeah, making sure that you're choosing a project that isn't so big and so complex that it's overwhelming. Um, but also not so so small and uncomplicated that you don't get as much as you could out of this process. Um, so yeah, it's really a balance to find a project that's the right fit for the training and also for your uh, capacity to dedicate time over the training um, to deliberately think through it. So from um, past trainings, we've found that for the adaptation workbook, projects on the scale of anywhere between like 20 or so acres to to a few hundred acres can work well um, for the process. Um, but it's really not just about size, it's also about complexity. So the trick is to find a balance where, you know, you may have one or a few ecosystem types and a handful of objectives for each of them. So that's kind of the, the middle Goldilocks zone. Um, and so you might have a project that covers a larger area, um, if the area is kind of fairly um, homogeneous and not too complex, um, or if you have a really complex ecosystem or a management issue that you're looking at, you might need to kind of work at a, a finer scale. Um, some size projects that work well could include a forest stewardship plan for a private woodlot, um, a management plan for a few stands and different ecosystem types, um, a timber sale, or perhaps, um, you know, taking a look at like one specific um, ownership or issue. Um, so for instance, like responding to Emerald Ash Borer. Um, so yeah, we are going to, we're here to help you again, if you wanna talk through some of these things. Great, so after you've chosen that project location and scope, um, you know, we asked you to start thinking about defining goals and objectives that kind of get at the overall intention of management on the property. 
And so we always like to get really clear on what the difference is between goals and objectives, since these, again, are the foundation for those later steps of the workbooks. So goals are really that big picture that set the context for what we're trying to do at a site. So these are broad, general statements um, that express kind of a desired state, a desired future condition, um, and may include, you know, descriptions of habitat characteristics um, or other ecosystem services. And they're often not a description of something that is attainable in the short term. Um, whereas objectives are really kind of more the precise steps to be taken to achieve those goals. So think of them as kind of the tiers under each goal that really dig into the how we are going to achieve our stated goals. Um, so in a lot of cases, you might be able to draw um, these goals and obje objectives from existing management plans or documents. Um, and you know, so you, may, you might have something like that to draw from already, or you kind of started to develop these in your step one. Um, but we do like to point out that you don't need to explicitly be mentioning or considering climate change at this point in your goals and objectives. So the idea here is to kind of um, sketch out those desired future conditions and maybe plans you might already um, have. And then we're going to be applying that climate adaptation lens. So don't worry about including um, that climate change uh, perspective off of that. And just quickly to run through some examples here, you can see, um, for instance, if the goal is to overall generally reduce invasive species cover, an objective associated with that goal might be to reduce the area covered by buckthorn from 10% down to no more than 5% over the next 10 years. So you can kind of see in both of these um, examples here that these objectives are what we call SMART. So you might have seen this before. This is kind of just a rule of thumb um, for developing good objectives. We want them to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Um, and so, yeah, the, the idea is to just kind of do your best here with developing these. We also have a moment in the adaptation process in step three where we kind of can look back on our objectives and potentially tweak them. So. Again, the idea here is to just try to make these as specific as possible to get that good foundation. And here are some more examples of some SMART objectives. Um, so for the management goal of uh, maintaining and increasing oak dominated and oak northern hardwood habitat, um, we have some more specific objectives um that look at increasing the acreage from 44 acres to 327 acres it's very specific um, over the next 60 years um, and establishing 150 to 400 trees per acre of northern red oak advanced regeneration on those 327 acres of site that could be supporting that habitat type and again it's um it is time bound over the next 15 years so that's just a sense of um, what some good goals and objectives can look like. And now that we're kind of clear on that, we're just going to um, step back a little and go through the process of refining these and then inputting them into the adaptation workbook online. So um, the first thing you'll be prompted to do in the adaptation workbook is to actually kind of split up your project area into management topics so that you can you can develop a manageable set of goals and objectives. So, um, you know, examples of management topics can be forest or ecosystem types, different land uses, or management issues. And so, again, these are just these umbrellas for your goals and objectives. And so, um, this will be ultimately how in the workbook you're going to then connect the dots to thinking about different climate vulnerabilities because each of these topics are different. Um, forest types or land management types are going to likely experience and respond to climate impacts um, differently from each other. And uh, depending on the overall size of your property, it may make sense to just choose like one or two different topics 
Um, if your project's on the smaller side, it might be doable to include all relevant management units. It really just depends. Um, but based on previous trainings, we found that um, usually up to four management topics is achievable, but more than four could get to be too much for the scope of this training. And when you go to define your um, management units in the online workbook, um, it may kind of auto populate with some predefined land uses um, or ecosystem types, depending on your project location. And um, if, the, if it doesn't um, come up with those predefined types um, or you have something really specific you're focused on, you will be able to uh, like name your own custom management topic. So as you can see here, there's uh, like wood turtle habitat or areas affected by hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so yeah, again, it is flexible. And let's see. So yeah, we had you complete your goals and objectives or start brainstorming those before this week. Um, but again, this is your chance to refine those. And people, you know, are always kind of all over the map in terms of how many they have. So we just want to give this, uh, this like sweet spot of, um, yeah, informing you that it's, Good to have at least one goal for each topic and try not to have more than four goals um, for the entire project. And this is give or take, you know, if you want to sneak an extra one in there and you feel good about it, um, be our guest. But that's just kind of what has, has worked for others in the past. And again, you know, your objectives are going to be those more specific um, actions. And so you're going to need at least one objective per goal. Um, but we'll likely have more than that, um, depending on how much work is, you know, needed to reach your goals. Um, so you you might end up having basically three to 12 objectives um, for the full project. Okay, great. So I'm going to pass it back to Danielle, who's going to give a tutorial on actually using the online adaptation workbook, um, which is going to, yeah, set you up to log on there between this week and next um, and start organizing your goals and objectives. Right. And right before that, I just wanted to put a fine point on all of the, the great explanation that Maddie gave is is step one of the adaptation workbook. And I know it might feel redundant because we already asked you to complete step one when you handed in our work, your worksheets. And on the whole, you were accepted into this course because you have pretty great goals and objectives, but it doesn't hurt to take another spin through them just to make sure that you're not taking on too much more than you can handle over the next couple of weeks. And also that they're as specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound as they can be. So. You guys are in the, the cream of the crop. You were accepted because you had an awesome project, but um, don't let that fool you. There's still a little work to be done. There always is. All right, so for some of you, um, the hardest part of this course will be using this adaptation workbook online platform. It is <laughs> unnecessarily difficult. And so we are spending a little bit of time just to spin through what it looks like and how to use some of these pieces because the technology isn't always you know, super intuitive. We're working on changing this. We're hoping that we'll have a better system down the line, but this is what we've got. It's pretty great, but it, could, it can trip you up. So. To kick things off, how do I use the online adaptation workbook? Well, I would say if you have no idea and this technology looks super foreign, click on the video tutorial. Uh, a few of us got together years ago and worked hard to create these super um, informative, they're like two minutes long tutorial on how to use the screen, how to push all these buttons, how to focus on things. So if you need that, check that video tutorial out. If you're more of like a reader, we also have a cookbook tutorial, which is basically the slides that we'll be presenting here. So the first thing you'll do, hit the tutorial, but you might be like, ah, get that screen out of here. How do I get that top bar out so I can get to work? And what you're looking for, Maddie, if you use your arrow, is that little tiny arrow right there. So you might have to change your screen size. If you're on a laptop, you might have to make the um, the zoom 90% just so that you can see the whole screen, but don't lose track of that little tiny arrow because it will pop it right up and scroll it up for you so you can get to work. Okay, next slide. 
So now that you're in, this is what the screen would look like once you're inside the adaptation workbook. And if you click the, um, there's two animations, you will find the course agenda and some notes. And this, this will outline all of the information that's in the training syllabus and also provide a link to the training syllabus. I just updated it and uploaded it. So you can find the hot, the hot copy is online already. And um, this will, you know, be the, the screen that you will see in every single step, and it will give you that instructions um, from drawing from the course materials. Okay, next little animation, but don't forget <laughs> to click that little, it's called a carrot for anyone who didn't know. So click that carrot, get it out of there, and then you can get to work. Okay, next next screen. Oh, and uh, actually, boop, back one more. Um, one thing that's really important, I know about half of you have already used the adaptation workbook, but what we need you to do is when you're creating a project, if you get into the workbook and you do not see this gray bar on the left, then you're not in the training. The gray bar that includes homework one, I should say, if you see the gray bar, but you don't see homework listed, then you're not in red in the training so you have to go back out and we'll show you how to do that but if you're looking to just bounce around the workbook you're wanting to see what it's all about use that left bar to navigate through the workbook okay next screen now here if you click the arrows for me this is called our progress summary instructional screen. So this is the first thing you're going to hit. What it is was designed for was to give you that snapshot of all of the pieces of the workbook that you haven't finished, because we recognize that some of us like to bounce around. We might we just like to see what's here, what's there. We like to go all over. And what can happen is you can lose track of how far you've gotten, especially if you open and close the workbook, maybe only once a week. You might not know what you actually um, created in the last session. So look to the screen, the progress summary, and you'll see those intuitive red, anything that's red is like high alert, you haven't finished it, and it will change colors as you have completed each of the steps. Some people find the screen to be kind of overwhelming, so feel free just to move right past it. <laughs> Use the gray bar on the left. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, this is good. So what I had alluded to previously, I noticed when I was including all of you in our um, training registration that half of you do already have accounts on the adaptation workbook. Now, when you typically create a project, you click these big yellow orangey buttons in order to add a project. If you do not see this blue uh, bar pop up that says add a project and like associate it to the training, then you won't see the homework. And if you don't see that, that homework screen, then you're not actually in a place where any of the instructors can see your progress. So we'll just wanna make sure that you have associated it to the training. Um, we can fix this on the back end if it's just impossible for you to find it. You know what I mean? You just, just let us know. But try your best to find that little blue box and click it for the training. Okay, next slide. All right, so once you create a project, you will see this pop up before you get into the adaptation workbook. And this is going to be where you will drop a pin on the map and you'll tell us geographically where you are. You can zoom in, um, but you know, it, it doesn't much matter uh, to us. Like we're not going to tell people the location of your project. So you can get as close to your spot as you'd like. It's This is a plan for you, okay? You can name it whatever you want to name it because it's your plan. You can describe it, you know, keep it all safe for work, but you can fill out those fields how you wish. You'll have name, description, acreage, size, ownership, and project type. And when you get to project type, that's really just helping to clarify, you know, what perspective do you have when you're managing your lands? And this will auto populate some resources specific to those topics within the adaptation workbook for you. So if you're a recreation person, it's going to be pretty obvious. You're like, I'm recreation. But if you don't really know and you're like primarily thinking about forests and a combination of other interests, just click forest. It's just the easiest default. Okay, so once you get into the adaptation workbook, based on where you've dropped your pin geographically, if you're in the Midwest and Northeast, um, you'll have more information for you, but we will have information for everyone across the country. 
if you've clicked forest and you're dropped your pin, you will actually see a preloaded list of forest types that are found within the place where you dropped your pin. Now you don't have to sort of, they're, they're just there as, as a default and you can go through and you can say, you can press that plus button and that will add it to your property, that screen on the right, or you can just leave it alone and not add any of the forest types. It's totally up to you. By adding a forest type, it will help to auto-populate some of that climate change information for those forest types. Um, but if you're not managing from that perspective, like you're just not managing, you know, montane spruce fir or whatever those forest types are there, and you're thinking about it differently, like invasive species management, then we would say click that orange button to add a custom topic. And that's where you can type in whatever you want, like moths, sugarbush, or invasive species. You decide however you like to characterize that piece, that place on your landscape. And Maddie went over that before when we were talking about management topics. Okay, next slide. Now this is, again, I got ahead of myself, defining management topics. And so we can organize our adaptation workbook from, we're trying to make, we've made a tool that's extremely flexible. And so with that comes a, quite a few options. And so these are one of the options. How do you want to uh, contextualize and frame your adaptation plan? Is it from a forest type perspective? Is it from a management type perspective? And so we're trying to give you those options. If you don't want to use this, you don't have to, okay? But for those who are interested in, you know, characterizing different parts of their landscape, like wildlife habitat, grouse habitat over here, or, you know, HWA response over here, you might want to create that custom management topic. So you just push the button, this pop-up would appear, you can label it however you would like. You can even provide supporting information, like by adding a link, and then you can save it. And those management topics will appear on that right hand side, which is sort of your mini dashboard for the property. So on the left, these are all the options available to you. You can pick and choose. And then on the right, that's sort of your cookbook. That's where you're working from. So it's got management transition hardwood here and invasive species issues listed as an example. Okay, and that is our spin through the adaptation workbook um, and step one. So I guess the summary of ideas here, um, Maddie, you can chip it, chime in too, is that when you're thinking about your project proposal, go back in there, really take a good look at it, um, make sure that you're not getting ahead of yourself, but also question yourself if it's too simple, right? Like Maddie said, you don't want projects that are just too simple because then it might feel like a waste of time to do the training. You can always use one of our quick guides as a, a quicker resource through the adaptation workbook. Just be in touch with us about that. But if possible, use goals and objectives you already have. This adaptation plan should complement the management that you're already doing or the conservation and stewardship plans you already have. So you don't have to create anything new. That's not the point. Your goals and objectives do not need to be related to climate change. That's why you're here. It's to test your goals and objectives on the idea of added risk. So climate change will bring lots of different risks at different times, spatially and temporal. So including climate change as a goal is, is a toughie, right? It's like very hard to wrap your head around. <laughs> so let's just make these as like by the books as you normally do. We're not trying to recreate the wheel here. Obviously look out into the future, Forest and, and natural ecosystems are long lived. So we want to make sure we're planning for that long lifespan and not just to the end of a, a grant agreement, which could be only five years. So think long, long down the road. So go back in, think about your goals and objectives. Try your best at the adaptation workbook. Let us know if you have any issues, if you experience any obstacles, and we can work with you on that. Yeah, I just want to clarify here, looking at the first bullet, that when we say, you know, use those objectives you might already have, it Danielle was speaking to that bigger picture of like what you already might have in terms of your management there, not necessarily that you're beholden to the ones you already submitted to us in, in your step one. Yes. Which you, so mm -hmm. definitely don't feel like, like if you just decide to scrap everything in there and come up with brand new ones, you could totally do that. We are not, uh, yeah, we, we encourage you to just, you know, find what works for you and, and put that in the workbook. 
Yeah, and I just want to speak to something in the chat. Some of you are working with groups, so spend this week to work with your group. Really meet, chat about that. If you know a consulting forester, that could also add some influence to your plan. If you're a motivated landowner, um, definitely reach out to them. You know, let's get those goals and objectives as clear as you can. It's only going to set you up for success at the end. Um, related to the adaptation workbook, Maddie answered this question, but just to verbalize it, um, if you're working with a team or you want to share credentials with uh, different people, do that, you know, sort of share credentials and say like, I'm going to work on it in this hour, you know, take it on at 12 o'clock. Try not to be there at the same time because there's a saving issue that happens. And unfortunately, like people have lost all of their work. So just make sure you're really clear about when you're in <laughs> or assign a note taker and let them be the one who has to sign in and out. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. Assignment. Um, Try to digest this hour long of us talking to you. <laughs> Check out that training syllabus. Uh, it really does have a lot of awesome information in it. Read it through. Try to use the tutorial at the end of the training syllabus that will show you how to create your account. It goes through all the steps I went through just now. Uh, read about the adaptation workbook in brief if you haven't done that, which is at the end of the training syllabus too, so you understand what's coming up. Then get into the adaptation workbook, complete step one the home, and the homework section. And then if you're still freewheeling and you have lots of time on your hands, like get ahead on the next step because the next step you'll find is really the climate change step where we're incorporating that data and projections. And it, it can take a while to get through all of the resources we're putting out there for you and more. So um, give yourself a lot of time for that step and start reading about it. Yeah, and one thing that's not on here is to attend your regional discussion session this week. So um, yeah, we've now shared a lot with you um, to get you set up for this, but obviously we want you all to be able to share with us and each other. Um, so that's really what those discussion sections are for. Um, so yeah, just come prepared to those this week to just share a little more introduction about your project, what's going through your head um, in terms of your goals and objectives, um, but also no pressure to have those totally figured out by the time your discussion session comes around this week, because it's really going to be a chance to talk with each other and um, yeah, kind of digest all this. All right, next slide. A little pitch for our upcoming uh, presentation. Like I mentioned before, I'm just going to blanket send all of you those calendar appointments. If you can't make it, I'm sorry, but the links to the videos will be included in the follow-up newsletters. So the upcoming session will be on March 29th with Courtney Peterson and Matt Steven, um, Matt Stevens, Steve Matthews from the uh, Landscape uh, LC Change Research Group, which is a USDA Forest Service funded research group to think about landscape level change. And they have created this very cool tool called the Climate Change Atlas. And if you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to do so. There's a tree atlas and a bird atlas. So check it out for climate projections on, east, uh, on tree species in the eastern region and um, get a sense of how that works before the session. And then next slide. All right, so this is the finale, the last slide. Um, just to wrap up, discussion session tomorrow and Wednesday. Be prepared to introduce your project and then get ready for next week's lecture on Monday. And that's all we've got for today. So um, thank you so much for attending and being so attentive. And we hope to see you learn more about your project this week. Bye.